if you want to build strong primitives, right, like strong foundations for the rest of DeFi, you cannot have um, essentially counterparty risk, right? Like one of the reasons that Uniswap is in such a advantageous position today is because it doesn't have any counterparty risk, right? Like nobody can, um, you know, go in and, you know, get, get, get screwed out of their trade because the other party reneged or anything like that. Right. Which means that building stuff on top of Uniswap is, is quite like secure, right? Like there's, there's, you don't have to worry about Uniswap itself, the protocol going bust. So having a, a very strong foundation to build on top of, right. And, and once again, one of the reasons that I'm so bullish on DeFi is composability, right? Like I expect that people will be building mountains of things on top of the infinity pools protocol. And so um, having like a strong foundation, number one, super important. Style podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Deus Ex Dao podcast. I'm your host, Lude, and with me today is Laskevia. Hello, everyone. Just a quick reminder that nothing said in this podcast should be considered financial or investment advice. And today we're speaking to Mathieu from Infinity Pools. Infinity Pools is one of the most hyped volatility products coming to DeFi over the next few months. Welcome, Mathieu. Hey, thanks for uh, having me on, guys. Awesome. And maybe uh, first point of call would be, could you please kick things off with an intro about yourself and uh, who's in the Infinity Pools team? Yeah, for sure. So um, first of all, uh, for myself, I'm a co-founder and uh, currently CEO, whatever that means, at a small DeFi protocol. But um, (laughs) Uh, my background, uh, I, I actually take care so of like pretty much everything that's uh, non-technical at the protocol, uh, including uh, some of the quant stuff. But my my background is actually quite technical. Um, so I studied computer science, was a quant for a little bit, um, and then uh, was a researcher. And my last job was actually as a product manager. So uh, have really been uh, all over the place. But uh, yeah. Um, um, the team is super small. Uh, we're seven people. Um, I think that each one of us uh, has managed to, uh, um, you know, have some accomplishments in, in the space and in some regards uh, is very, very lucky uh, with like whom we've managed to hire. Um, so our CTO, uh, Pierre, um, is a PhD in math uh, from Cambridge. Uh, then was a quant at Goldman, Tudor, a uh, bunch of other like really cool quant shops and uh actually fun fact about him is that he uh he had built a product a DeFi product uh treasuring uh uh, sorry um tokenizing treasury bonds on bitcoin back in 2014 or 2015 before ethereum had even ico'd uh kind of a fun fun fact um and then uh our front-end team is actually the same one that built uh matcha the dax aggregator um, so they were both working at zero X together, uh, before joining us. And then we've got, uh, our backend engineer, Tony, uh, who's, uh, also traditional finance, uh, uh, originally, but, uh, then was a backend engineer at Bitmax where, um, uh, he, he did a lot of like really, really interesting work on like their API and like, uh, a, a matching engine. And uh, and then was actually a, a CTO at a DeFi startup uh, before joining us. And lastly, we've got our two uh, smart contract engineers. Uh, one of them is uh, a, kind of an OG in the space, built a lot of the early protocols, uh, including uh, the first prediction market, AMM. Uh, for, for those that are in the know, it was called Catnip. Uh, was doing you know millions of dollars volume, I believe like 90% of Augury's volume at some point. Uh, before, um, you know, it was, it was taken over. Um, and the last guy, also PhD actually, uh, but this time in machine learning, 
and then uh, was working at Uber's Autonomous Cars and Drones division before getting into crypto, ran a, a MEV shop, and then joined us. Oh, and actually, we uh, we just hired this guy. He's he's going to be working part time with us uh, initially, but he's a professor of quantum physics um, at Cambridge University, and uh, yeah, he's going to be helping us with uh, um, some some like auditing math stuff um, and some coding stuff. Yeah, so uh, as you can see, pretty pretty small but uh, very stacked team. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that team team is stacked, and uh, anyone that was building real world assets uh, on Bitcoin before the eighth ICO is that's like OG status. That so very impressive. Um, all right, well maybe for to kick off the podcast um, and what you're building at Infinity Pools, could you give us a quick outline for the audience of what Infinity Pools is and what problem um, are you aiming to solve? Yeah, for sure. So you know. Um, Infinity Pools is really uh, the the first exchange ever, really, to be able to offer theoretically unlimited leverage on any asset with no liquidations, no counterparty risk, and uh, no oracles. Right. So, what problem are we trying to solve? Well, uh, there's a bunch of different ways to like really look at it, right? Because we're we're really a new financial instrument, right? So. If you look at it from the point of view of futures, well, the real problem that we're solving there is that, you know, you've got liquidation risk, right? And like liquidation risk is is essentially the root of all evils. And I, I can like expound on that a little later, but um, essentially uh, it, it means that you've got limited leverage, you've got, you know, liquidation penalties that eat into your expected returns. You've got a limited number of assets that are available for trading, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so that's that's the, the the problem is when you look at it from the point of view of futures. But when you look at it from the point of view of options, well, then the problems that we're solving are uh, really uh, all around liquidity fragmentation, right? And and trader UI UX. So you know um, the the fact that when you when you're dealing with options, really like one of the biggest problems is that because you have uh, fragmentation of liquidity across both strikes and expiries. It's 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 not a great instrument for uh, long tail assets. It's not a great instrument for 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 yeah, a co- couple of different. Uh, I, I won't get into it right now, but uh, high level, that's uh, that's who we are and uh, some of the problems that we're that we're tackling. Yeah, cool. And I think like uh, on Twitter, and there's been a lot of hype around what you're building, especially we saw you um, presenting a few things at ACC as well. And um, there has been a lot of sort of talk has revolved around uh, the li- the leverage, I guess, for long tail assets. And I know that that is what everyone like the DGENs are extremely excited for is being able to have sort of liquidation free leverage on these assets. But what other sort of more sophisticated use cases do you see? Um, so I've have, have heard some people speaking about like Forex traders using infinity pools, but what what else do you see beyond just like the DGEN shitcoin trading that um, everyone's just talking about at the moment? Yeah, for sure. So um, and it's a great question, right? Um, um, I, I do believe that, you know, while, while our offering is very DGEN-like and, you know, the marketing is a bit loud, um, I, I do believe that this is a really good uh, financial tool that um, any sophisticated investor should use um, instead of, you know, perps or options. Um, so wh- wh- why do I say that? Well, there, there are a couple like different use cases that I have in mind. But, uh, you know, one of them that, that, that you mentioned is for sure Forex trading, right? So. I think that in our V1, we're going to be able to accommodate up to 10,000 X leverage on, um, you know, not that, uh, so what was it like USD, Euro, uh, Yen, USD, obviously with like, you know, the, the stable coin equivalents, but, um, and if you look at the traditional finance markets, right? Like where you can see the highest levels of leverage is actually in the Forex market. So there's a clear product market fit. It's just that, you know, once once you go beyond like 100x, the traditional finance markets are simply not equipped to um, um, to 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 handle that that kind of that kind of risk. Um, also, um, 
we're going to be able to offer up to 100,000x leverage on pegged assets, right? So I'm talking USDC, USDT, staked Ethereum, Ethereum. And I, I think that there are going to be uh, some incredibly interesting use cases on that front too, right? So I'm talking uh, either yield farming um, on, on staked Ethereum, uh, maybe even like some uh, staked Ethereum, Ethereum arbitrage, right? Because once again, when traders enter or exit um, infinity pools uh, trades, they can actually use any DEX or spot DEX that they want, right? So like in the back end, we're using one inch, but um, yeah, it, it, it could enable some some very interesting arbitrage or like yield farming there. Um, and then obviously, you know, with USDC, USDT type type assets, then um, or like stable coin, stable coin pools, right? We could see people trying to break stable coins, right? Break their pegs when they see that like there are some fundamental flaws in their designs. Uh, but we could also see people hedge against um, so some of these breaks, right? So like people borrowing and making sure that, um, you know, in, in case a, a stable coin does lose its peg, uh, they're, they're, they're covered. So um, th those are two immediate use cases. Um, I think that we're going to see also potentially, um, yeah, some, some, some interesting I, I won't get into it, but yeah, lots of uh, MEV, like new MEV strategies are also going to be enabled here. But uh, but that that's that's really getting into the weeds. So uh, I won't get into it. Yeah, what is potential? Um, I feel like um, those use cases that you mentioned um, already make me even more bullish uh, than what I already am on infinity pools. So. Uh, full disclosure for everyone that doesn't know me, uh, I am uh, a very, very big infinity pool spool. Um, and uh, I believe talking about the use cases of what you're building uh, brings uh, brings forward like two topics uh, for the conversation that I would like to uh, bring on today. Um, so I believe that there were uh, many good podcasts uh, that touched on Infinity Pool's core protocol dynamics up until now. Um, and some of which did a very good job, I believe, uh, digging very deep into those. Um, for instance, the Flywheel podcast, of which I'm a big fan. Um, but yeah, the two topics that I would like to, um, to touch on today are a bit more uh, leaning on um, the philosophical uh, side, maybe. Uh, and not so, maybe uh, the not so intuitive second order of consequences of uh, of what you're building and how they could affect us going forward. So the first one would be obviously um, LP profitability, um, the pricing of LP in risk, and how will that compound through DeFi? So I believe that everyone is aware that um, Impermanent loss is a major issue for LPs. Um, and, uh, but yeah, um, it goes even beyond that because uh, LPs are inherently short volatility. And even though recently uh, that, uh, the fact that volatility has come down in a very significant way um, is it may be, may be better for LPs, but historically speaking, um, Volatility has been quite high in the crypto space. And unfortunately, LPs um, tend to take the, the worst side of it, meaning that if you provide liquidity in a net USDC pool, uh, if Ethereum moons, uh, you're swapped into a USDC. And if Ethereum drops as an LP, you're swapped into Ethereum. So if you pair that with permanent loss, just-in-time liquidity, um, other potential MEV-like activities that can extract value from liquidity pools, I believe that um, it's easy to comprehend how being an LP today in DeFi can be quite risky. So I believe that LPs aren't actually compensated adequately for the risks that are, they are taking for providing liquidity today. And one other way that I could express this, um, this concept is that longs in the LP markets in my opinion, are lacking incentives, um, which we could refer to as fees or premiums, maybe. Um, 
So um, this is very important because it, ca it, it causes a, um, a lot of liquidity issues um, and the general lack of liquidity throughout all DeFi, all pools in DeFi. Um, so what I believe it's very like um, on a conceptual base, what it's important to um, understand and, and the way that infinity pools comes in here uh, is by enabling one side of a market, which is the short side of the LP in market, um, which just wasn't there up until now. Um, meaning that like you could long be in an LP, just going anywhere like on Uniswap and, uh, and just provide liquidity on there. Um, but yeah, by allowing the shorting of LP positions, um, you allow shorters to beat up the fees um, for those LPs so that they can finally be compensated fairly. Um, so to speak, for their risks. Um, and I believe that this has the potential to natively improve um, the on-chain liquidity landscape in a meaningful manner. So um, I believe that infinity pools will certainly play a big role in unlocking all of this. Uh, can you tell us, Mathieu, uh, what do you think about this zero to one moment it's, as Sam Kazemian himself describes it um, and what the implication could be going forward um, for all DeFi? If impermanence, impermanent loss hatch, impermanent loss risk gets hatched, and LPs profitability profiles improve in a meaningful manner. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I, I, I guess I'll start off with like the the very basics, which is that impermanent loss is is really a bit of a misnomer. Um, and permanent loss is very permanent, <laughs> you know, like once you lose money, you lose money. It's, it's not, it's not really coming back. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've already got qualms with, with just kind of like that phrasing, but, um, and permanent loss itself is not the problem, right? Like when liquidity providers go short volatility, they are essentially betting on, you know, the, the price. And, and like, I'm talking like specifically, you know, if, if they like provide liquidity within a given range, they're, they're essentially, um, you know, expecting that the, the price of the asset will stay within that, that range, right? So um, number one, um, I guess, I'll, I'll start by saying that like impermanent loss itself is not a problem, right? It's 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 something that we will never get rid of because it's just the way that like financial markets are, are like, you know, like people, some people are going short volatility and some other people are going long volatility. It's just how it works. Now, the real problem is that um, liquidity providers that are suffering from this impermanent loss are supposed to be compensated fairly for the impermanent loss that they incur, right? And currently what is happening is that in many pools, um, uh, in, in spot AMMs uh, in particular, um, uh, they are not being compensated fairly for incurring that impermanent loss. So um, what is the reason for that, right? Well, there, there, there are a couple different reasons, but the main one is very often that um, people can only sell volatility, but not really buy it. Right. So like people can provide liquidity to, um, you know, uh, Uniswap, for example, but they can't just short the LP token and go buy volatility. And what that means is that when you have this constant selling uh, uh, pressure on volatility, well, um, what we call the implied volatility of the underlying AMM, which is what the AMM prices uh, 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 prices volatility at um, is is below realized volatility, right? So what that means is that um, the AMM is saying, "Hey, um, uh, liquidity providers, um, you're selling volatility right now, but we're actually going to be compensating you um, below historical volatility levels." Um, it, it, that doesn't make sense, right? Because um, usually in traditional options markets. Uh, implied volatility is above realized volatility. So it's, it's actually the opposite. So basically, um, right, being able to go short an LP token 
allows you to um, essentially take that implied volatility and actually push it up back above uh, uh, realized volatility. Um, essentially, it, it, it allows you to get rid of um, some of the extra selling pressure that, that, that are in these markets and bump up the yields. So the first, for the first time ever, really, in, in you know, AMM DeFi, you will see a LPs get compensated at least fairly, if not overcompensated in certain markets. Um, yeah, and you know it's it's a it's a it's a huge zero to one moment because um, it'll finally allow liquidity providers to, you know, be fairly compensated for like the risk that they are taking out, which is um, obviously. <laughs> The yeah. crucial tenets of all financial markets. Yeah, uh, and in fact, like um, I'm pretty happy um, with the uh, with all the progress that DeFi is making um, under the hood, so to speak, or under the surface um, these days. Because um, while everyone is pretty much uh, concentrated on um, Telegram bots and Twitter shares. Um, uh, there's actually there's actually these DeFi primitives that are uh, tackling some um, some very important issues that um, have been present in even in TradFi, um, like for instance credit risk. Um, that would be my um, my second topic for today. Um, I remember I remember watching uh, a YouTube video of. Uh, of your uh, talk that you gave at ETH Denver um, on uh, basically on uh, um, liquidations and, and credit risk. Um, so just to sum it up for everyone, um, on infinity pools liquidation happen without any credit risk for the protocol. Um, and it's pretty much because all the liquidity is posted uh, upfront um, to any positions. This is obviously pretty big in the world of finance. Um, yeah, I, I would actually even go further and say that there are no real liquidations in, in infinity pools, right? Like it's, uh, yeah, um, you can, your, your position can get closed if you stop paying the interest rates, but it's, it's, it's quite different. And I think that it's very, very important to separate liquidations from the forced closing of positions. Now, it, it may seem like very much like a terminology um, you know, kind of like uh, technicality, um, but it, it's it's actually very very important because liquidations usually imply liquidation penalties, uh, and these liquidation penalties, you know, like they can go from whatever one to three percent of the position notional, right? Which which might be like <laughs> like almost all of your collateral, um, and um, it, it really eats into the traders expected returns, right? So when you have liquidations and you have liquidation penalties, um, it's, it, it eats into traders expected returns. Essentially like traders are expecting to make less money than on a platform where there are no liquidations, i.e. Uh, infinite pools, right? So I, I just really wanna make sure that you know, that there is a, a clear distinction between yeah, the draw line the, the, the two, two systems. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. It's just that my mind is so um is so accustomed to think about liquidations constantly, as these are um probably one of the uh, most important um dynamics that in fact um affect capital efficiency in protocols. So in this case, we could just leave liquidations out of the uh, out of the discussion, uh, but yeah, um, my thoughts are really that since r credit risk management affect capital efficiency in protocols, um, essentially as credit risk approaches zero, capital efficiency can improve tremendously uh, in these protocols. So um, to speak the common, um, say, uh, the common language for DeFi agents, uh, LTVs and collateral ratio, loan to values and collateral ratio um, will approach the 100% mark um, as um, capital efficiency improves. Uh, I believe that 
this could have some incredibly interesting uh, and uh, incredibly bullish um, like effects on the packs of DeFi derivatives in general uh, and strengthen them significantly. Um, like uh, while while everyone is so focused on um, on other topics, I believe uh, this under the surface is is brewing. Um, and um, what's your, what are your thoughts about this? How, how do you think this um, will impact DeFi and and potentially how will Infinity Pools play a part in all of this? Yeah. Um, so. I think that you know counterparty risk, um, which is which is actually even even yeah like a, a superset of credit risk, right? And and the absence of counterparty risk in infinity pools is is actually very much like a I want to say underrated aspect of it, right? Like people, uh, you know, when when they talk about infinity pools, like they always talk about like unlimited leverage, um, you know, the no liquidations, like the fact that like you know from day one. We'll, we'll be able to like offer like the best the best fees in the entire market, but like very few people like you know come up to me and are genuinely excited about the no counterparty risk, except for you know maybe a more a few more sophisticated actors. I think that it's 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 incredibly important for for a couple of different reasons. Number one, if you want to build strong primitives, right, like strong foundations for the rest of DeFi you cannot have um, essentially counterparty risk, right? Like one of the reasons that Uniswap is in such a advantageous position today is because it doesn't have any counterparty risk, right? Like nobody can, um, you know, go in and, you know, get, get, get screwed out of their trade because the other party reneged or anything like that, right? Which means that building stuff on top of Uniswap is, is quite like secure, right? Like there's, there's, you don't have to worry about Uniswap itself, the protocol going bust. So having a, a very strong foundation to build on top of, right? And, and once again, one of the reasons that I'm so bullish on DeFi is composability, right? Like I expect that people will be building mountains of things on top of the Infinity Pools protocol. And so um, having like a strong foundation, number one, super important. But um, number two, it's it's also the fact that um, we've seen specifically in crypto counterparty risk um, wreck an incredible amount of people. Right, I'm talking from um, you know um, the the forced settlement of markets. Right, so like um, um, what what are some examples of this? Right, like yeah, talking like problems. mango markets, like Euler, right, like uh, all these people that are essentially um yeah like taking out uh, sorry you said something i remember a protocol um that was called iron finance that was built on polygon that at some point since it it gained too too much traction and effectively it, it was a ponzi <laughs> but uh basically um like i believe liquidation stopped at some point because polygon froze and it all went crashing down like in a terrible death spiral uh, because effect effectively, um, everything stopped working there. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's definitely like, I, actually, so it, it's interesting. If you look at the leading cause of exploits in DeFi, it's actually all Oracle manipulation stuff, right? And anytime you have an Oracle, you are taking on some kind of counterparty risk. And in fact, like very often it is severe kind of party risk, right? So any protocol that uses an Oracle, um, and this means perps, lending protocols, um, you know, pre pre pretty much everything like currently that, 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 that touches like, um, like oracles is, is, is privy to getting, um, um, wrecked at some point. And if not today, tomorrow, right? Because, uh, Oracle risk is not a, uh, you know, like, oh, we're fine today, so we'll be fine tomorrow kind of thing, right? Oracles, um, they have really two axes on which they can be manipulated. Number one, um, it's, it's you know, um, the, the volume, right? So like the liquidity of the asset, right? So like 
if an asset is illiquid enough, well, you can manipulate the Oracle to um, then, you know, just give you, give you some like crazy price. Uh, but then two, there's also um, uh, time, right? Which is that, um, you know, a, a, an asset that was liquid today uh, may not be liquid tomorrow, which means that um, an Oracle that might work today might not work tomorrow. Um, so, so there's, there's once again, just like so many different like, like attack vectors here that, that you need to be careful of. And this is like in DeFi, but like counterparty risk is everywhere, right? Like even in traditional finance. And I think that in the end, right, like who we're really competing with or like the, the whole of DeFi, right? It's not, it, it, we've got like a very small pie currently, right? Like we've got like, <laughs> like a couple thousand like on-chain traders. Like that's nothing, right? Like the, the real incumbents are, are still very much like traditional finance. So like, one of the things that I also want to do is that, like, I want to compare us um, um, and, and to traditional finance exchanges and see how we're specifically improving over that, right? And you, you see it all the time, too, like counterparty risk in traditional finance where, like, uh, uh, people renege on their trades because, you know, like the exchange, uh, the underlying exchange, like, went bust or, like, there was a settlement error. Or there was, right, like, we, we, we've seen it happen all the time from, like, Swiss franc um, uh, uh, a scandal to, like, you know, Robin Hood uh, shutting down, like, trades because of, like, T plus two settlements. Um, yeah, it, it, it counterparty, tris, it counterparty risk, like, exists everywhere. And Infinity Pools is really, like, the only and the first protocol or the first exchange ever in both TradFi, CFi, and DeFi to not have any when it comes to leverage. But this is uh, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that makes me so bullish. Um, Infinity pools and generally um, DeFi uh, because of how um, like there's people like you um, developing that are um, kind of more focused on this approach um, to just build uh, natively inside DeFi. Uh, the models, the primitives, um, the ways uh, to just basically um, build better incentives, uh, financial incentives, and engineer them uh, to um, to resolve problems um, natively inside crypto, and to uh, basically come up with a financial system that is going to be um, way more inclusive and with more meritocracy at the end of the day. Uh, because I see a lot of actors these days in crypto and teams trying to develop on, on Tradify concepts that um, like, obviously it's a good thing, uh, but we should move, uh, I believe uh, one step beyond those and build on top of those, um, not fall back uh, just to please some, uh, I don't know, some, big actors uh, to, to bring external capital on chain, which at the end of the day is very, uh, is very important. But at the same time, I believe that um, they should come to us because we got the, the solutions uh, to known problems, such as uh, credit risk, for instance, yeah. um, and not the other way around, uh, like being us having to go um, back for liquidity when um, like there's there's potential issues uh, with uh, uh, with the whole uh, liquidity providing market. Um, but yeah, uh, happy that we're, uh, that infinity pools is tackling that and uh, and yeah, uh, I'm so I'm so bullish looking forward. So the next question would be definitely when beta launch? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, and, you know, to, to like quickly, like, um, say one, one more thing, um, to the previous, to the previous thing you mentioned, which is, you oh, know, yeah. fairness, accessibility, trans transparency, et cetera, et cetera. Like, yeah. I, I do believe that all of those things are incredibly important, but unfortunately, you know, in, in the financial system and specifically traders, traders are very, um, you know, profit driven, right? Like they're very like P and L driven people. Um, yes. And in the end, 
traders are just going to be using the exchange that makes them the, the most money. That's it. Like risk adjusted, they are always going to be using whatever makes them the most money. And I, I think that Infinity Pools is that, and somehow also managed to be fair, transparent, and accessible, et cetera. And like those are like fantastic secondary characteristics. But in the end, the real reason that I believe that you know most people will be using our, our protocol in the end is because of um, you know <laughs> the fact that they can like traders are just uh, uh, their expectation is that they can make more money on on our platform than than using like perps or uh, like pretty much anyone else. Uh, but yeah, sorry. Um, so yeah. one one beta launch. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, we've actually already have like a up and running beta right now that we've just been testing internally. Um, there are still like a couple different bugs um, that that we're, we're we're currently solving. Basically, like we're we're uh, what we're doing is that uh, we're sending it to like you know five people at a time. Um, they're reporting bugs, they're reporting edge cases, they're reporting stuff. Uh, we fix those and then we send it to five more people. And we like do that progress like process over and over and over again. And we've been doing it now for like two weeks. Um, but I, I feel confident that um, it, it's it's very much a matter of weeks before we have, uh, and, and like by weeks, I mean like one to two weeks max before we have like something that is publicly accessible um, to everyone. Can't wait. I'm so looking forward to that. Yeah, it's, it's actually been, uh, it's actually been quite fun. Um, just myself, like, uh, trading with fake money. Uh, so basically our beta is, is going to be obviously like, you know, fake money, but, um, the, the price, the prices are real. Um, the liquidity is real. Basically like it's, it's, it's very good simulated environment, right? So, uh, basically, like if your trades work on, on in the beta, they, they probably would work IRL. Um, and um, uh, and so it's just actually been fun for me, like obviously going like, you know, 500, 600 X long on Ethereum, you know, when it crashed a couple of days ago and like see my PL like go, go, go Love. crazy. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can wait to try that out too, um, because I believe that um, there is where the real alpha lies uh, being able to understand how to use these new products um, because of how the markets are are skewed right now to one uh, to one side of as we said um, basically uh, basically selling volatility. So it's going to be very very interesting to play to play around with it and to be ready when um, the the real the real deal comes available. Yeah, I think I think it's quite exciting as well. Uh, just due to the current narratives that we see, we see some sort of CFI exchanges offering higher and higher leverage. Like we, there's Rollbit with a thousand X, and there is a large demand for that. And I think the byproduct as well is is LPs benefit from this as well. So the DGENs get their taste for extra leverage, especially in low volatility times that we have at the moment. But then on the other side, it also makes it more profitable to be an LP. Um, during these these times, so um, you did drop a little bit of alpha then of the public beta uh, being live in the next few weeks. Is there any other alpha that you can let any of the listeners know, or uh, anything regarding a token or anything like that 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 you don't mind sharing? Yeah, for sure. So you know, there, there's there's a couple of different ways that I that I look at like tokens and tokenomics, right? Like um, number one. Uh, you know, Infinity Pools is uh, a, a DEX that allows permissionless market listing, right? And like, you know, where we're going to see like a, a long tail of tokens, right? So um, uh, our expectation is that, you know, you're going to obviously have a pro proliferation of, of the long tail tokens. So it is very much like within, um, you know, our philosophical interest, <laughs> if you will, to 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 issue token, but um, that said, I, I I don't really have. We honestly haven't really made any decisions yet, right? Because what we really want to see first is, well, how does the protocol 
uh, perform uh, without incentives, right? Um, and then once once we figured that out, um, you know, and we can like really um, get get the real um, signal, you know, like separate like this the signal from like the potential noise of having incentives. Um, then we can really start to reevaluate. Well, okay, um, what are some of the behaviors that should be incentivized? Uh, what are like um, uh, essentially like how should we redistribute uh, and incentivize certain behaviors such that you know we can really kick off network effects and hit that escape velocity um, such that the the protocol um, can can really you know like scale uh, exponentially. Yeah, it makes total sense. So let's first focus on um, the real core. Um, product itself let's see its scale and then if there will be um like uh, a potential or philosophical uh interest uh in, in in issuing a token um then you will be an even better position and wink wink everyone it's uh, it's yeah probably, it's, it's, it's yeah yeah it's, it's more like i see it like as a growth lever right like you don't you don't like hit the growth lever before you know like what what you want to like actually grow right it's it's like it, it, the token is a silver bullet that allows you to kick off like crazy like growth and like network effects but if you don't use it wisely then you're essentially just wasting it right so yeah you you, you do need to be able to know exactly what things need to be incentivized and and grown to like really uh, optimize the network effects. But yeah, sorry, I uh, didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe I saw the, I, I heard these days, the same meta uh, metaphor uh, of the token being ba basically um, gas fuel, that if you put it on um, basically something that works, you got a rocket ship there. Uh, but if you, if you, Put it on top of something that just just doesn't work with its uh, core dynamics and, and traction and everything. You're just gonna burn the house down. So it makes total sense. And uh, and yeah, uh, I believe that with what you said, I was winking uh, to the community to just um, suggest go and try Infinity Pools once it's live, uh, not just with the beta, uh, but once the real deal comes out, it's probably gonna be like. Uh, very fun, but also potentially, uh, yeah, uh, something that's worth your time for sure. Yeah, yeah, I uh, def definitely excited for for people to try it out, give us feedback. But uh, more than that, like excited to like see, you know, uh, honestly, our, our users make money because in the end, like that is that is like what the main goal of the protocol is is that uh, you know we we want we want to see our, our users succeed. And, uh, and yeah, um, I actually like this is kind of like a, a fun fact, but, um, uh, most per protocols are, are zero sum, right. And in, in which like, you know, you, for every long, you have a short, um, and what that means is that, um, if somebody's winning money, that means that like somebody else is losing money, um, because infinity pools resembles margin trading a little bit more where you're essentially borrowing money uh to to go long or short um it is not actually a zero-sum game uh in fact um when token prices go up um both liquidity providers and traders can make money at the same time um <laughs> which is uh yeah so uh infinity pools bullish uh we're, we're bullish uh on on, and on crypto <laughs> we, and we want to be bulls we like this uh we like yeah, that's the uh, that's the real alpha there. Um, so I guess we've, we're reaching the end of time for today, but thank you very much, Matthew, for coming on um, and giving us the rundown. And thank you, Laskevia, for some very uh, interesting philosophical questions. Um, maybe last thing, where is the best place for the listeners to find you and uh, follow and keep up to date with what you're building at Infinity Pools? Yeah, for sure. So we, we really only have two places um, where where you should go uh, find us, our Discord and our Twitter. Um, we'll be posting updates um, um, very, very soon on both of those regarding our progress. 
And honestly, like once we ship like the first version of the beta, things should go by really fast. So we'll like continue shipping much, much faster because a lot of like the initial work was just groundwork to set us up for, uh, yeah, what's uh, what's about to come. So yeah, keep keep in uh, keep in touch. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Oh, we heard it here first. Everyone, jump into the Discord, and um, hopefully, there's some exciting announcements coming in the announcements channel in uh, the next couple of weeks. And uh, thank you for tuning in, and um, we'll see you in the next episode of the Deus Ex Dao podcast. Thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks for hosting. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Deus Ex Dao podcast, a place where some of the most progressive and innovative builders, thought leaders, and traders in the crypto space come together to discuss all areas of the crypto industry. Whether you're into DeFi, Layer 1s, Layer 2s, NFTs, or anything in between, we've got you covered. And as a reminder, Nothing said on this podcast should be construed as financial advice or as a solicitation to buy or sell any digital asset or security. The comments, views, and opinions expressed by the hosts or guests on the podcast are their own. As always, you'll need to do your own research.